Good morning, church. Happy New Year and happy Lord's Day. Question, Brother Charles. How do you know that I'm going to preach again about joy and happiness? Do you know that? I don't know that. <laughs> well, I haven't seen you since last year. I got that from Sister Liliana. Liliana. <laughs> Thank you for the prayers, um, Brother Darius and Brother Pete. And what a uh, joyful singing that we have. Thank you, Brother Charles. God bless everybody. And uh, first of all, I want to thank the Lord for another year that has given to all of us. Um, and looking forward for another year of wonderful blessings, another year of happiness and joy with the Lord living a Christ-centered life. And uh, again, um, I want to um, welcome uh, John and Lovely in the back. Thank you for uh, joining us this morning. And Tim, a friend of uh, Brother Ryan, back. thank you, um, Tim, for joining us today. And also, we appreciate uh, Brother uh, Joseph Fleet and uh, Sister Jocelyn for you know, being here with us and um, making this their uh, home congregation. And, uh, and this morning, we will continue, as usual, <laughs> our uh, lesson about joy and about um, living a Christ-centered life. For the past, Two months that I've been here, uh, we've been talking about happiness, okay? uh, how to have real joy. Now, and we say it is by living a Christ-centered life. And it is my prayer that it opened our eyes um, to what true joy really means. It is also my hope that we have seen the importance of Jesus Christ in our life during the course of our lessons for the past two months. And uh, it is also my hopes that it challenge our thinking to align it with the principles and truths about God and life. Now, that those lessons of ours taught us a new perspective in life as we enter now into another year of blessings. And uh, as we enter now into another year, are you ready for more truths? Are you ready for more truths from the Bible? Well, of course, we are. But the real question is, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends, and those who are watching us in Zoom, the real question is, are you ready to accept and live out the truth? Okay? That's where we separate the boys from the men, as they say. Living a Christ-centered life is about the truth. Believing and living the truth. It's not about lies. It is not about pretensions. It's not about pride. Because Jesus is about truth and he is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way <clears throat> and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, here's an interesting fact, interesting truth about this statement. Jesus is making an exclusive truth, exclusive statement that he is the truth, that he is the only way in which we can be with God in eternity in heaven. He is the only truth, meaning we only need to listen to his words and to no other, only to him. That he is, he said, the only life. He is the life in which, apart from him, is death in hell, and there is no life apart from Jesus Christ. Now, have you ever observed uh, that we live in a world that runs on standards, that runs on rules, 
Have you ever observed that? Well, I know you've noticed that. Take, for example, medicines. Okay? Those that we are taking. You know, that there are these government agencies that were set up to strictly monitor all those drugs by having a strict standards that needs to be followed for our safety, right? Now, those that build buildings and houses, the engineers, the architects, they have standards that must be followed to ensure the safety of not just the building, but the safety of those who dwell inside that building, who use the building, okay? the safety of all of us and the safety of the properties. Okay? They have the standards in which they have to follow. All right? Now, without those standards in place, we will live in a chaotic world. Okay? Why? Because everybody will have it their own ways. There will be no laws to follow to keep the citizens' safety or safe. There will be anarchy if there's no law, right? Now, for all these standards in place, we welcome this and accept this as our laws, as our regulations. And we are so grateful for it because there are, these are put into place to safeguard all our safety and to protect our lives. Ironically, my dear brethren, there are people who just don't accept that there must be also a moral standard in our lives that we need to follow and adhere. All right? We are so thankful for those other standards, but we are not following a moral standard. If we agree that there must be standards and laws regulating things and matters that involves our safety, why not agree also that there must be a need for us to follow these so-called standards for our morality? Now, the fact of the matter is, some people, they dislike it because they view these standards, they view these instructions, set of rules to be followed as an unfair imposition on them. Okay, one study revealed that, quote, they would rather lose something than submit to the rules of others, unquote. Now, simply put, people just want freedom. People just want total independence. You know, in a civilized society like what we are now, there can be actually no complete freedom. There can be no complete freedom because a civilized society, it requires rules, it requires standards, regulation, and this limits our freedom, correct? Now, what some people want is really to have their own way, be able to do things without restrictions. Now, this is so true when it comes to morality, okay? Now, because of this clamor of the so-called freedom, you know what? We lose our morality. And guess what? We are actually becomes slaves. Now look around us. Look around you. Look around in your neighborhood. Look around in the family. Okay. When our children go, grow up, when they are already adults, they want their freedom. Correct? They go out of the house, they leave their parents, have their own family, have their own life, you know, go into this, go into that. Why? Because they want total independence. They want freedom. Okay? They try out different things, vices, etc., etc. Now, unfortunately, soon that freedom will enslave them. Their vices it will lead to addiction, it will lead to depression, it will lead to crime, and it will lead to poverty. Now, our children turn adults will try out what we call premarital S. You know, live in for a couple of months, couple of years to see, you know, if they click. Then if they don't click, they look for another and another and another. Now, a famous couple 
here in the U.S., they tried it out for 10 years. If they will click. And somehow they did. After 10 years of living together, they got married. Only to find out that after two or three years, they are not clicked. Then they got divorced. You see, freedom. That is freedom. The so-called freedom that we all like. Okay. Our own set of definition of freedom is actually distorted. Okay. Our children just don't want to have their parents have a say in their lives. You know, because they say, you know, my parents keep on telling me, you have to be home by this time. You, have, you, don't, you don't have to do this. You have to do that. Children just don't want to have their parents telling them what to do. Now, if we will look at the definition of freedom, it says the power or right to act or speak or think as one wants without hindrance or restraint. In general, this is the definition of our freedom. But this definition can never happen. My dear brothers, sisters, and friends, I tell you why. You know, when I got here, legally, I can drive with my foreign driver's license up to some extent of time. Okay? Now, assuming that extent of time was over, expired, the question is, can I still drive? Well, the answer is yes and no. Technically, I can drive. Because I know how to drive. But legally, I cannot. I cannot drive. I just cannot take Brother Charles' keys to his car, grab it, and drive his car around. No. I need to follow whatever the DMB, the DMB's restriction, the DMB's rules about driving here in the U.S. You see, it says there, think as one without hindrance or Restraint. That's why that cannot happen. Because in a civilized society, we cannot really have absolute freedom. Because we have some restraints. Okay? Now, the problem with our freedom is that the choice that we make for us to have this freedom that got us into slavery in the first place. Our clamor for freedom actually what got us to sin in the first place. If we will go back in Genesis chapter 3, but God did say, you must not eat from a fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not teach it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. This is freedom. Freedom in the first place got us into slavery. Freedom in the first place got us into sin. Now today, we will be talking about the consequence of our choice of freedom. Particularly, we will be talking about the four Ds of temptations in relation to a Christ-centered life. Now number one is, the first D is the desire. In James chapter 1, Verse 14, temptation comes from our own desires. You see, God created us with free will. And with it is your desire, our desire. We are not a puppet with strings attached to us. We are not a robot <clears throat> that we are controlled by a remote or a program. Our desires includes to love and to be loved. Our desire, desire for authority, desire for power, correct? We desire to be wanted, to be accepted, and to be appreciated. That's part of our desire. We desire for independence. We desire for knowledge and wisdom. We desire to be significant, and we desire to be valued. Those are part of your desire and my desire. Now, all these desires are good things. They are nothing wrong with it. Okay? They are very much part of us. They are part of God's creation in all of us. So, where does the problem lies? <clears throat> now, it lies when Satan starts to corrupt our minds. Satan knows what is your weak points. Where is your weak points? 
and then there he will attack you. Okay? For example, for example, the so-called freedom, our desire to be independent, our desire to be free can lead us to addiction. Our desire for authority and power can lead us into corruption and greed. Now, we've been talking about God wants you to be truly happy, right? Now, look at this. In Psalm 37, verse 4, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Psalm 37, verse 4. Now, it is clear that God wants you to give you the desires of your heart. But how? But how? Now, people often quote this, but in fact, they don't really know the meaning of this word. I repeat, do you have a coin? Anybody have a coin? Just one. Thank you. Oh, I'll keep the other one. Okay. Since you gave this to me, I'll give it to you with a condition. A coin, a flat, rounded, hard. Can you do something out of this coin? Can you make another shape out of this coin? I'll give you five seconds. Then give it back to me. Yeah. But mind you, don't turn it to $100 bill. Five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, not. Okay, Brother Charles, here's a uh, napkin, um, squared, flat. Okay, I'll give it to you. Same thing. In five seconds, do something. Make a shape out of that and give it to me. Again, don't turn it into a $100 bill, but if you want, then it's okay. Okay, I'll give you five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. So it turned triangle. Okay, now what's my point? The point is, oh, I forgot. The point is, the light means to be soft, pliable. God called us okay, to delight in Him, to be soft and pliable in His hands so He can shape us, so He can mold you into whatever ways He wants. Just like what Brother Charles did to the snapkin. Okay? And then He said, He will give you the desires of your heart. Now, it is the desires that are not in conflict with God. He will give you that desires as long as it does not violate the principles of God, especially God's character, God being holy and good. God wants you to be happy by giving you your desires when you let Him do His will for you. Delighting in God, it means going His way and not your own way. I'm going back to this later on. Now, take a look at this again. In James chapter 1, verse 14, we read a while ago, but take a closer look. Temptation comes from our own desires. Okay? We want it our own way. Not God's way, but my way. Again, going back to the illustration a while ago, just look at the coin. Okay? That is hard and impossible for Brother Pete okay, to transform it into another shape. Okay, it's hard. So is our hearts that are callous and hard that doesn't want to yield to God, but will only yield to its own evil desire. You see, delight means being soft and pliable, just like this napkin, this tissue into the hands of Brother Charles, from being square, he turned it into another shape, a rectangular shape. You see, God wants you to be that. 
God wants you to delight in Him, to be soft and pliable in His hands so that He can mold you in whatever ways that He wants. God wants it His way, not your way. So delighting in God means yielding to God's desire, not your own desire. Now, Eve, during at the garden, okay, her desire was to be more significant. Her desire to be independent. Her desire to become powerful, you know, seeing the opportunity of becoming like God, even more than God. She did not saw that they were already significant to God by God giving them dominion over everything. She did not saw that. She wanted more because her desire was awakened that she can have more and be above God. And that is desire. The next D is deception. Okay, deception. Going back again, James chapter 1, verse 14, temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. You know, the concept of the word entice and drag away is like that of a fisherman and or a hunter who both set up a lure or a bait or a trap to catch their game. Okay, So that's the concept behind. The lure used by fishermen are what appears to be a good food for fish. Okay? Nothing fishy about it. Okay? But underneath the hook, or underneath that lure is the hook. Okay? And the trap by the hunters is hidden. All right? Now, deceptions or lies, they work the same. It wants you to believe in the same thing, but in fact, it is not the same thing. It only appears to be, pretends to be, but it is not what it purports to be. Okay? Now, the hook and the traps are hidden. The real intentions are hidden. In deception, you are made to believe that you are truly loved and cared for, but actually you're not. Okay? You thought that your friends are your really good friends, your really good buddies, my BFF, my besties, but actually they are not. Okay? The hidden intention is to ruin your life and drag you away from having and enjoying God's eternal love. Now, Satan, he will use his cunning skills, you know, to drag you away from God, to deceive you. Now, remember this, and this is what Satan is good at. In John chapter 8, verse 44, he has always hated the truth. There is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Nobody can beat Satan in this field of lying. He is the maestro. That's why he is called the father of lies. He knows your weakness. He knows what your struggle is in life. And he will appeal to your desire. Turning that into an evil desire. He will contradict whatever you believe to be true. Okay? Now, trying to camouflage his lies, making it appealing to you. Then, arousing your curiosity and therefore will create doubts on your part. And when you follow him, good. There is a good touch. At last, the devil will say, finally, I got you. See? Now, just like what happened to Eve, the devil lied to Eve, then it arose her curiosity and start to doubt God. That's why in Genesis chapter 3, 4 and 5, Again, but God said, you must not eat from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. That is what God said. But look, the deception of the devil. The devil said, you will not certainly die. Okay, deception. The third D is disobedience. Going back. To James chapter 1, 14 and 15. Then these desires 
give birth to sinful actions. Now, let me show you what happened to Eve at that day. Okay? How the devil did it on that day with Eve. Now, first, the devil said, Eve, come here. I have something to tell you. Okay, come here. Okay. Let me tell you something. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, he calls Eve attention. Okay, He calls Eve's attention first, then leading them to talk about the fruit in the middle of the garden. Satan awakens the desire of Eve. And look at what happened in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Genesis 3, 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining, he aroused Eve's curiosity. You see, when Eve saw, when her desire was awakened that he will be like God, well, this is the, per, the, the first part of, this, of the temptation, the desire. Now comes the second part, the deception. That the fruit was good for food, pleasing and desirable for gaining wisdom. Now, all of these are untrue. Actually, they are untrue. Why? Because the fruit was not good for food. Because it was not meant to be eaten. Okay? It was not pleasant or pleasant and desirable for gaining wisdom because only the only wisdom that they got is when they knew that they were naked. That's the only wisdom that they got from eating that fruit. Okay? Now, the third, all that Satan said, what? That it purports to be are not all correct. Okay? Then the third, it leads to disobedience. Disobedience, she took some and ate it. Okay. okay. There we go. Then she took some and ate it, she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Disobedience. Disobedience. Disobedience, it is unwilling to be persuaded, which showed itself outward disobedience. Okay. Spiritual rebellion begins with decision to reject what God prefers with his offer to persuade about his preferred will. Now, it is clear in this definition of obedience that it is a sin, a rebellion against God. They are unwilling to be persuaded by God not to eat the fruit. But still, they ate the fruit. They rejected what God prefers and decided to do what they prefer instead. They rebel against God by defying his words Defying his commands and not submitting to his rule. That is rebellion. Now you see, the word rebellion, it has a war or you know, military meaning, military word. When you rebel against God, it means that you are waging war against him. Now, just a point to ponder. Just a point to ponder. Do you think you will ever win against God? Now, think about that. Then the last D is death. James chapter 1, verse 15, it says, And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. You see, temptation, there is your desire, there is your deception, then disobedience, and then after that is death. Romans 6.23 for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, it is crystal clear that eternal death awaits us if we continue to defy and continue to live in sins. 
Now, the best part is this. In James chapter 1, again, it says, And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. It says, if you allow sin to grow, it gives birth to death. If you allow it. The Bible is telling us that there is an option not to allow it. Okay. Now, the, que the question is how? By knowing the truth about freedom and its rebellion or relationship to sin. We ask for freedom and then again, that freedom actually causes us to sin. John 8, 32, 34, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus replied, Verily, verily, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, what is Jesus talking about the truth? What is the truth that Jesus is talking about? In verse 34, it says, The truth is that when you follow your evil desire, when you live in sin, you choose your way, you are a slave to sin. You see, it is not actually freedom. It is slavery. And Jesus tells us that the truth will set you free. What is Jesus talking about? Truth will set you free. Remember John 14 verse 6. Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Now Jesus is talking about himself being the truth. That if you have him, he will set you free from the slavery of sin. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You see, as Christians, living a Christ-centered life, we view freedom differently. We view it differently. True freedom is this. Now, we go to the last D. Okay? Last D. Our final D. I want you to remember this. D. Y O S. Dios. I think Brother Carlos knows what this is. Dios. God. In Tagalog, this is God. And it's in Spanish, this is God. Dios. What does it mean? Real freedom. Living a Christ centered life means total devotion to God. Real freedom means saying yes to God, no to sin. Real freedom, it means your obedience to God. And real freedom means being submissive to God. And I want you to remember that. That, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends, is real freedom. Living a Christ-centered life. Freedom is your desire to follow God. To follow your desire, followed by your actions, to pull the obedient and be submissive to God. Peter Marshall once said, may we think of freedom not as the right to do as we please, but as the opportunity to do what is right. True freedom is the power to do what is right. Doing what is right is doing by God's standard. And God's standards are morally right, acceptable, and fair. Now, brethren and friends, freedom as it is commercially advertised, it's not real freedom. It is slavery. It is not what it seems to be. Real freedom that brings real joy and satisfaction is slavery to God. That is being real freedom. And that is being free. It is a Christ-centered life, delighting in God and not in our own evil ways. Now finally, brethren and friends, as we start the year, Start the year with the bank. Start the year with God. If we have lost track of our relationship with God, you know, come back to God. Come back to God. Make a loud noise about your relationship with God. Be proud about it. Now, my dear friends, if you have not yet accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, start the year right. Don't let, don't let this another opportunity slip you by. As you buy. Don't be slave to your sins, but be free with Jesus. Come today, repent, and wash away your sins.
Why not come forward? We will be waiting. The elders will be waiting. I will be waiting. And our Lord Jesus Christ will be waiting for you. Now shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation.